finally decide to come go out to the scene? Well, for, well let me ask a, a, a better question first. Were you ever officially activated by Sergeant Carpenter or anybody else? Did anybody say, I'd like you to come out and make this a full SWAT activation? No. Okay. So how is it that you ended up going there? So the reason I ended up going is I eventually found out from a canine officer who had arrived. He couldn't get a hold of a supervisor, so he had called me. He explained that there was a male individual who was armed with knives, threatening to kill officers. He had a little bit more information. He said that when officers originally arrived, that he had pulled knives on them and threatened to kill them. And he believed they had the charges of uh, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He also informed me that I believe I had one SWAT unit that was already there and assisting. Okay. So at that point, as a supervisor, and when your employees go out to a scene, I have to go. I'm ultimately responsible. So I started that way. I also realized that this had all the criteria of a SWAT activation. You had an individual who had a felony, he was armed, and because of his position of advantage, he was barricaded. He was in an elevated position. So I met the criteria for the SOP from the department as far as SWAT activations, and I started in that direction. Okay. Um, before you arrived there, did anybody ever tell you that in fact it had been the open spaces officers who pulled guns on Mr. Boyd before he pulled knives on them? Judge sure, sure. assumes facts, not the evidence. Okay. Uh, were you ever informed about who was the first aggressor between Mr. Boyd and the open space officers? No. Okay. Um, so who, which of your officers were out there before you started out there? Um, Jeff McFarland. Mm -hmm. He's an officer that works for me. He was there, and then as I was in route back to my house to get my police unit, I got a call from another officer, Anthony Settler, who says he was close and he was going to be going to the scene. Okay, and before you arrived, did you find out that yet a third SWAT officer had activated to the scene? No. Um, let me hand you what's been marked as, well, have you reviewed the transcripts of the dispatch calls in this particular case? Yeah, to, uh, and did you do that to help refresh your recollection about what transpired? Okay. Yes, um, before you arrived, I'm going to ask you if you can read this page 36 about whether there was a, a, some calls about a third SWAT officer being out and see if you can review that to refresh your recollection. Okay. All right. um, whether there was a third SWAT officer who was at the scene and radioing and asking um, questions. Are you referring to Officer Purdue? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I actually called Officer Purdue to the scene. Oh, so okay. When he arrived, I was under my direction. All right. Why did you call Officer Purdue to the scene? So to take you back is when I arrived at my vehicle and I started monitoring the radio. I had more information from the canine officer that this fit the criteria of a SWAT activation. Still not real sure what I had because I still need to go out to the scene, talk to the supervisor. I started activating several different officers to assist me because, again, based on my experience out there and my training, I knew that I was going to need some help. So I made a phone call to Officer Purdue, James Purdue. He brings a skill set that I needed. He is a high ground officer. He's able to deploy at a great distance and provide cover to officers. But the most important thing, he's able to gather intel and radio back to me. Okay. Can you explain what a high ground officer is? Sure. A high ground officer is a, he's a precision rifleman. His skill set is a rifle. He will deploy or he'll try to deploy in a concealed area uh, so that he can't be seen. And the reason he does that is because he, again, he gathers intel for me. He covers movement with the entry team or the arrest team, or he may be covering a perimeter position, or he may be covering a large field or a big area. Okay, and let me, let me put up what's been marked in a minute. It states 39A. Hold on, I'm cutting him off. Hold on a second. And is that 
uh, Jim Purdue that you deployed out to the swamp to the uh, foothills. That is him. Okay, a and we've heard him described in this case as a sniper. Is that a that, fair that's description? A, that's a that's another yeah that's another term used for his skill set. Okay, so so what makes him able to both provide cover and then to provide intel? What about his equipment he's allows equipped, him to do he's that? He's equipped with a optic that has high magnification. He's able to zoom in a little bit more than officers on another perimeter position that can't, they can't see with the naked eye or with their optic system. So his big advantage is his optics. Okay, and can you show, maybe on, draw on this where those optics are on his weaponry there? Sure, can I do with my finger? Sure, 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 sure. Can you make a circle? Sure. Yeah. Okay, and why is that particular uh, optic better than optics on other people's guns as far as both providing cover and providing intel? I don't know if it's better than other optics, but it fits his job. Like I said, his, he wants to deploy at distances. So this allows him the magnification capability to zoom in or to look closer. Basically, it's like binoculars. You take binoculars and you place them to your eye, of course you're gonna be able to see things a lot closer than if you did it without the naked eye. Okay, why, why is it important to have somebody who's away from the action, who's looking at the action to give other people information? Why is that important? Well, it depends. In situations, he's may be able to stage in an area of advantage where he might be able to be in an elevated position where he can see things that officers on ground level can't see. All right. You know, and he trains, they train for that, they go to schools for that. And so, and because he's dressed in a, in a way that the picture shows in camouflage, he's able to conceal himself. So he can get close or as far as he needs to be. And the person that he's surveilling may not even know that he's there. Yeah, that's that's usually what we hope for. So, okay. I mean, there's, there's times where it doesn't work out that way, but that's the main objective, yes. All right. Is there any advantage to having somebody who's, who's observing things and reporting things who is not in the heart of the action? Sure. A lot of times they have a greater field of view. They're able to see a little bit more than maybe the guys right there at the the point of the situation, the, the big problem area. Okay, and, and is uh, just from a adrenaline standpoint, uh, about make and decision making standpoint, is there an advantage for having sure, somebody? Sure. Uh, is there any other advantage for having somebody who is away from the action um, and calling out information rather than just people right next to the action? Sure, he can clearly get on the radio and radio back to me what's going on as far as if there's any action going on or what he sees or any movement or any threats. Again, he is a gatherer of intel. And him being away from the scene, a lot of times he increases his field of view and he can see different things of interest or things that may be a problem to us or a danger to us. Okay. So it's nice to have him back in the way. And if he sees a threat, an immediate threat or an attack on the officers, is he authorized and capable of shooting uh, the person who is a threat? What else can he do with that rifle besides provide intel if he feels that the person is an immediate threat? Based on use of force SOP, he is authorized to deploy deadly force. Okay. Um, was Jim Perdue... Um, and what you didn't call him a sniper, you called him something else, so I want to use your term. He's a, he's a high ground officer. Okay. Was Jim Purdue your high ground officer communicating with canine officer Weimer Scourge over the radio before you arrived at the scene? Yes, I did hear a few transmissions of him communicating back and forth with him. Okay. And what information were they discussing uh, between Jim Purdue and canine officer Weimer Scourge? I don't they know he was, they communicated as far as possible perimeter problems, interperimeter problems. Um, I know that he uh, asked for a description or asked uh, kind of in the area where they were at, the officers that were with them. I don't recall what else they 
we talked about. Okay. At, after um, Jim Perdue per arrived, um, was he able to locate where everybody was and establish whether or not there was containment of the perimeter? And if you'll turn to 37, if you need to refresh your recollection about those comments that might be on there. Yeah, when he, when he eventually was deployed and started gathering intel, he, he said that he could see things, he described uh, the suspect, he gave the clothing description, and then he was able to look to see how the perimeter looked from his position, and he felt like it was, it was okay at that point. But, okay. they, but it took some movement to get there. Okay, so he, and when you say it took some movement, what was he doing? I believe he advised Jeff McFarland that if he could take a position further north, that that would help out. All right, and was he able to establish, um, well, first of all, where did he deploy? Where did, where did um, uh, Mr. Perdue uh, deploy? So he was south of the arrest team or entry team. All right, and was he able to determine whether there was containment in the north, west, and east? I don't believe so, because just based on the terrain and how he was positioned. Okay, I'd ask difficult. you, to, would it refresh your recollection to look at page 37? Sure. Okay. In the highlight part? Yes, sir. <laughs> he says he's located everything. Yes, sir. And just give me a minute. That section, ma'am. Yes, sir. Let me let me have him review. Let me. Uh, okay, I got this part. So this right now she's asking a review. Just review it, okay. and then I'll have you testify. Rather than okay. have you testify. No, no, okay. Okay. All right. So um, was he able to um, establish containment in the north, west, and east? Yes, that's what he says. He says he it looks like the north, east, and west have containment. And can you explain what containment is? Containment is again that inner perimeter. It's that officers who keep the scene from growing. All right. And did he radio that out over the radio so everybody would know about that? Yes, yeah, it's over the radio. And, and why did he put out on the radio where he would be? Because he wants to let officers know where he's at, just to avoid crossfires. Or if anybody happens to be in a different position and they need to get a hold of him or we need to get information to him or relay in some type of uh, equipment, we know where he's at. Okay. Um, and was um, um, Mr. Purdue a able to, uh, from his position, see that, that, the, that James Boyd threw something at the officers? And if you can go to page yes. 38. At one point, he did state that uh, he had thrown something at the officers. Okay, and did they figure out what that was that he had thrown at the officers? Yeah, I believe they said it was uh, just a sandwich. Okay. Um, and then uh, um, did, he, did um, Mr. Purdue talk about being concerned about something called crossfire? Yeah, that's one thing we all are concerned about uh, on an interpreter position. Anytime we deploy is crossfires. What is your backdrop? Make sure that each other are not in the line of fire if a deadly threat does present itself. All right, and, and can you explain what crossfire is and why sure. uh, Mr. Purdue in the South would be concerned about crossfire with other officers? So he's concerned, he's letting them know where he is at to the South. So he radios it over the, the air so that if anybody on the north perimeter sees a threat, if they take that shot, then in the direct line of fire is going to be James Purdue. So those are type of crossfire situations. He'll also radio where he's at, so if there's any activity that's going on, as far as the arrest team and entry team, we need to let him know that we're moving so then he can come off of that rifle so he's not covering us. Okay. Did you have some communications with Jim Purdue trying to find out what was going on at the scene before you arrived? And I would flip you to page 41. I think he actually has to answer the question first before she directs him to what page. Okay. Uh, did you have some communication with uh, Mr. Purdue about um, trying to find out what was going on at the scene? Yeah, I asked him briefly if he, he was deployed. 
first he told me he was still getting in a position. I believe I'm still en route. And I asked him different positions. And he wasn't sure right away of who was where. I uh, wasn't sure what officers, what, as far as their names or their call signs, what positions they're in. And I don't know if, if we talked about uh, the negotiations. And I don't think he knew who was negotiating. He did not know who was negotiating. Um, and did he know? Um, um, uh, did he have information about three officers, Weimer, Skirch, Sandy, and Ingram, and whether they were the ones that were negotiating? I don't recall if he had any information of who was negotiating. Okay. That would refresh my memory. Well, to the extent that calls for Well, Judge, I think, if he, I think he can refresh his recollection. And also on 42, I think, too. 41 and 42. Yeah, he, he stated there was face-to-face -face negotiations. But I don't ever remember if he said who exactly was doing the negotiations. He did mention that he had uh, two rope detectives also in that position. Okay. And then we talked uh, about me staying out the air so he could call out any movements and I wouldn't be clogging up the air in case important information came. All right. Now, can you hear, hear what someone is picking up on their taser cam? Does that get broadcast out on the radio? No. Um, and so, if th the three officers, Weimer, Skirt, Sandy, and Ingram, and let me put up what's been marked as 7C7, the still from the Weimer, Skirt, taser cam, if these three officers were having a discussion on a taser cam, would that be, and if you can tap the bottom left twice to get rid of that little green thing there, I think down the lower left corner there. I think it's okay. Left, I think, down the bottom, let me see. Um, if they were having a conversation uh, on a taser cam, is that something that would automatically go out over the radio? No. All right. How would they have to communicate any plan to the rest of the people who were there if they were talking on the radio, talking to each other on a taser cam. It's actually a formal question. You don't talk on a taser cam. Well, talking and being recorded on a taser cam. Okay. How, what is the only way that you would get information about what they were planning? If a telephone call, or, and that's a lot of times what we use as a telephone, just based on technology that is out there and available, we try to stay, if we're talking about plans that are going to be done during the critical incident. We try to keep that off the air. Okay, so you could not hear what these three were saying to each other unless they told you it over the air in some way. Is that right? That's right, ma'am. Okay. If I could borrow those pictures Um, when you, uh, uh, before you arrived, were you aware uh, of where the three officers, Weimer, Skirch, Ingram, and Sandy, uh, were located in relation to Mr. Boyd? Yeah, when I arrived, ma'am, I got a hold of the supervisor, Sergeant Carpenter, and he kind of gave me a visual I'm in the backyard of the uh, individual who called. And from the backyard, I'm actually able to see the elevated position where James Boyd is at. And I was told that the officers are just to the south of him. So I kind of had a rough area of where they were at. All right. Um, were you aware of the, of the conversation 
that um, Weimer Skirt Sandy and Ingram had at 716 about there being nothing dynamic taking place? No, ma'am. What does that mean that nothing dynamic is taking place? There's a cause for speculation. Is that a is that a term that a term that is used in SWAT situations about something being dynamic or not dynamic? Is there going to be a question about the exhibit? I don't know why we turned um, I think the question was: Were you aware that this is where these three officers were located here on 32E3? Not their exact location, but I had a rough idea. Okay, and does that picture comport with your rough idea of where they were um, right before you arrived or at the time you arrived? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, uh, were you aware um, um, when you arrived about the decision at 716 of Weimer, Skirch, Ingram, and Sandy to wait um, to s for a more or less lethal options? Sorry, you yes, sir. Were you aware of the conversation between the three of them at 716, four minutes before you arrived, uh, about a decision to wait for less lethal options? No, ma'am. Okay. They didn't communicate that to you, did they? No, not when I first arrived. All right. And, and were, did, did you arrive with some other SWAT officers? I arrived right behind, a little bit behind James Perdue. And then shortly after I arrived, I had Officer Ramon Arnellis and Officer uh, Dominic Perez. Okay. Um, do you know uh, why those three officers moved up close to James Boyd shortly after you arrived at 720? I do not know. Did they request permission what did you announce to everybody that you were the SWAT sergeant and you were on the premises when you got there at 720? Once I arrived I know that uh, Scott Weiner Scourge, Officer Weiner Scourge asked if 710, and that's my call sign on the radio, asked if I was en route and I explained to him give me an approach route in and then once I arrived then I started making those announcements, started taking some of the initiative as far as calling out what I call saying moving people, so. Okay. Not formally did I tell them SWAT sergeant's not taking over, but in my actions. They would know? Yes. And would that be conveyed over the radio to Weimer, Scourge, Sandy, and Ingram, that you were there on, on site? I guess I would just assume that they would think I was there if I was actually moving people okay. and, and communicating. I uh, was informal with the radio. Um, did Weimer, Skirt, Sandy, and Ingram request permission of you to move from their location down below up to where Mr. Boyd was before they made that move? Objection, compound question. Yeah. The only movement that was requested when I arrived or right before I arrived was Officer Perdue requesting that Jeff McFarland move a little farther north. And then the only movements I made as far as just it'd be the inner perimeter north positions, making sure the west, and then I moved a little bit uh, to the east containment officers. To the okay, did they even tell you that they had moved locations from down below up to where um, Mr. Boyd was right after you arrived? No, ma'am. Okay. What was the first indication that you had that they had moved from down below up to by where Mr. Boyd was? I guess I didn't know that they had moved. Okay. Just um, based on the, the terrain, like I said, I explained to, or Jason Carpenter explained to me kind of the area where they would be. And because of the terrain, it was hard to see. The only times I could see James Boyd from his position is when he became animated, animated and he would wave his arms around. So actually seeing any of the perimeter positions from where I established my command post, the only time I could see one was when Jeff McFarland actually started moving and then I could pick up his movements. Okay, where, and where were, you talked about where you set up your command post. Where did you set up your command post? Uh, in the backyard area of the uh, original call. Okay. Um, did you uh, get a call from Jim Perdue letting you know or over the radio, not 
a radio call letting you know that there was some problem because of the movement of these three officers. I don't recall if you didn't mention anything. Okay, if you can go to page 43. And if you could review that and see if that refreshes your recollection about Jim Purdue alerting everybody to a problem based on their movement. Yeah. Um, this conversation says that if, if they're going face to face, then in, in layman terms, he's going to be out of play. He's not, he's not going to be able to do too much as far as being a cover officer. Okay. And, um, take them out of the equation as far as providing cover. Okay, and why do you say that? Why can he no longer provide cover if they get between him and the person he's supposed to be providing intel on? Judge, objection, Your Honor, relevance, is, it's, it's implying facts that have not been established in evidence. It's a safety issue. It's the crossfire that I was on here about. If you step in front of somebody's muzzle, Position, you take them out of play if you're making movements in front of them. So okay. they can no longer provide cover. Okay. And can you show where Jim Purdue was approximately at the time of the shooting and where this was for Sandy White? Judge, you know, extend his lack of foundation for this officer to testify to that. Did you know where all these officers were as you were trying to establish a perimeter? I knew the vicinity, where they were at. Like I said, elevated and there's depressions, me being down in the backyard, I had a rough idea of where everybody was at as far as their positions. I and knew I had some on the north, the east, the west, and the south. And where was Jim Purdue? Same objection, Your Honor. A rough idea is not specifically pointing on the map. Um, can, you, can, you, can you show the jury where Jim Purdue is? Jim Purdue's position is south. Okay. Grab, we'll do it on this side too. Can you, can you point it out for this side of the jury too? Sure. This would be Jim Purdue's position. Okay. Your Honor, I think we're at a good breaking point. 